Hey there, movie fans. Welcome to For Your Consideration. This is Collider Video's weekly award show, counting down to the Academy Awards, which will take place February 24th, 2019, which, ladies and gentlemen, we're closing in. It's going to be here before you know it. And this past week, here in Hollywood and across the country, a lot of award shows have already sort of kicked in, or awards groups, critics groups, have weighed in. And right now, it's looking like the front runner is... Well, we don't know. Because, First uh, reformed. <laughs> Tis the season. Tis the season. <laughs> Tis the season for a, uh, a troubled priest. <laughs> you know, first reformed. No, really, there is no uh, front runner, and that's the beauty of it. But a lot of different critics groups have already weighed in, and a whole lot more to come. We're just really getting started here on For Your Consideration. You know, we're, we're, we're really sort of like the next month or two months on this show are really going to be fantastic as we weigh in on all the categories and also sort of do a uh, post-mortem on some of these uh, critics groups that have picked their best movies and best actors and actresses of the year. Joining me, joining me is not Perry Nemiroff because, you know, she's, uh, she's out, she's working, she's covering, she's covering the junket for Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, and then she's going to interview Andy Serkis for Mowgli. She is everywhere. She is with us in spirit. She is our Perry Normal activity, and she is the best. So instead, it's just me and this guy. This guy. I'm all you got. Me, Sorry. <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend, the monster. <laughs> that is Jeff Snyder. Always great talking movies with you because it's always a great conversation. Oh, you bet. It That's, is always very, very interesting. Do. Right? Right? Yes. This is what we, this is how we And roll we've here. got a great conversation for you guys today. We're going to be talking about the New York Film Critics uh, Awards and whatnot, the National Board of Review, the Gotham Awards, some some tweets, some memes that have been going around. Who knows what could come up? Who knows what could come up? So let's get right to it with right. the New York Film Critics. They just weighed in with their 2018 winners. And let's uh, let's just talk as we go through here. Their movie, their movie and director went to Roma and Alfonso Cuarón. Super obvious director. choice for the New York uh, critics. Why? Like, why? It just like it's a black and white foreign film. Of course, they're going to give it best picture. Like it just. I, I think Jeff Wells. Uh, you know, because I, I read Jeff Wells pretty, pretty closely. Forgive me. Um, yeah, and why? Uh, <laughs> you know, be, because because at times Jeff Wells speaks the truth, and and he correctly predicted that New York would absolutely go for this. It was just obvious. But, I mean, you know, he's not going to be the only one. Like, in the next week, you got the L.A. Online Film Critics. You got the L.A. Film Critics Association. The Golden Globe nominations are this coming Sure, Thursday. and listen, other, other organizations and, and critics groups uh, could go for Roma, and, and will probably go for Alfonso Cuaron, who I feel like is a shoe in this year for Best Director anyways. Um, so that was the, you know, correct choice, so to speak. I just thought it kind of it, it has, you know, New York critics' sensibilities. It appeals to their taste. And you know what? Here's a film that is just starting to be seen by the masses. It's in select theaters now it drops on netflix on december 14th but yet it's already it's been praised since it first debuted at the trifecta of venice telluride and toronto back in the beginning of september and obviously i'm not surprised at all that the new york film critic circle went to roma but there it was not a unanimous decision for for those uh, uh for the other critics groups that, that have weighed in and we'll get to that in a second sure uh, but you know i'm not surprised i think that is definitely worthy it is a it is one of the very best movies of the year and i think there are a whole lot of other groups are going to weigh in for quaron for best director i think other groups will will certainly go for best picture although uh they might just sort of relegate it to the foreign film and pick something else for best picture but new york film critics uh just like you, you said not a shock yeah i knew that they were going to go for ethan hawk too like that's just a very new york criticsy choice i was surprised by regina hall i mean that that's a legitimate curve ball well that's a supporting did ball. you now did no it's not no no, regina, no 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 so there's regina hall and regina king Right. Okay, Regina King was supporting for Beale Street, but Regina Hall won Best Actress, their Best Actress, for Support the Girls. Have oh. you even seen that movie? Oh, yeah, I saw that at, uh, oh, I saw that at South by Southwest back in March. I, I rented it a couple months ago. That, on that is definitely, you're right, I, I was thinking Listen, that. Listen, I, and, I, and I thought it was okay, that movie, um, and she was very good in it, but, like, 
it's it's kind of a shocking choice. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's. I, I mean, I don't really know anyone else who's actually seen that movie. Support the, the girls. The New York critics. I think that they tweeted something to the effect of how, like, you know, their their voting process is immune to the political pressures that affect the Oscars and things of that nature, and that they're, they're just here to award good work. And this is good work. Was it really the best performance that I've seen this year, or, or one of the top five? No, uh, but you know what. I, I respect it. Well, uh, I for best first feature, eighth grade. I mean, eighth grade has to get love, and it is getting love, and it right. got love from the New York film critics. They named it eighth grade. And the Gotham's too, which, I think. Right? Yeah, which what's you know for for this film, we'll get there. you know, eighth grade is a film that uh, out of Sundance, other than the documentaries like uh, like uh, Three Identical Strangers, and definitely um, uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor. You know, eighth grade is the movie, is the feature film, the narrative feature that really stood out from Sundance this year. And it is a film that has uh, sort of stayed at the top of the conversation all year long. I mean, the uh, the Spirit Awards, it was a big a big nominee there. Uh, but it, yes, for, for critics groups to have like a best first feature, because I don't think it's strong enough to get best picture, it's definitely I for best first feature. I included it in my recent best picture predictions over at Gurus of Gold. Uh, because I think that it is coming on strong, eighth grade, and I think that I, I just don't know a lot of people who have said bad things about this movie. No, like, it's great. It's, it's very yeah. agreeable uh, towards everyone. And, you know, like I, I saw Vice last night, which I didn't particularly care for, was very underwhelmed. You know, I don't know if that's guaranteed a nomination anymore. I, I just think that you could see some interesting stuff happen in those seven, eight, nine slots for Best Picture. Um, and speaking of which, First Reform, not only winning Best Actor for, for Ethan Hawke, uh, who, who's coming on strong in the acting race, but also best screenplay. You know, like, what do you think of, of you know, Paul Schrader's chances there? And, you know, the film has, like, the 70s aesthetic that I think uh, appeals to writers. Well, I would say Paul Schrader, I mean, he did some of his best work in the 70s sure. as a screenwriter, obviously. He wrote Taxi Driver. And he actually, I don't know if you know this, he actually wrote, wrote the first draft of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, wow. But, uh, but Spielberg did so much rewriting on that script that Schrader talk, took his name off of it. And Spielberg is credited as screenwriter for Close Encounters. Just some trivia, interesting trivia. Ooh. But, you know, ever since, uh, ever since First Reformed premiered at Telluride the previous year, I mean, it opened this year, but it premiered at Telluride the previous year. This is a film that critics love, and uh, New York film critics, again, it's a critics not, movie. Yeah, it's a critics movie. It's a downer. It's depressing. I didn't but, love the end. I thought it went right off the rails at the end. I'm but sorry. How did that movie go off the rails and in a way that Taxi Driver did not? Because those two movies are very similar. I, get, I guess with, uh, I, I see what you're saying there. Um, and with Taxi Driver, I just went with it, and, and this one I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. This one, That's like when it difference. was going there, <laughs> when it was going the, you know, driving the Taxi Driver route, mm -hmm. especially coming from Paul Schrader, I felt like okay, it's sort of a, um, a, a maybe a, a nod or a derivative of his own screenplay, whatever it was. I thought it was very effective. And Ethan Hawke, not only did he give this great performance in First Reform, but he also gave a great performance in Juliet Naked, which was a wonderful film. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, and then he also directed Blaze. Blaze, which I need to see. I really Blaze like to see that. Blaze is great. You know, Blaze is a great um, movie. A lot of good movies that are just really flying under the radar. But First Reformed broke through the radar to hit with the New York And he's film paid plays. his dues. So I think we're going to talk about him later in the show uh, when we get to a, a certain Mark Harris tweet. Um, but, I, you know, in the supporting races, I wanted to talk about those real quick. Regina King, like you said, with Beale Street. Do you think that she's the front runner now for that award? Oh, oh for, for, yeah. I for Like for, more than Amy Adams, Claire Foy, the favorite stars, all that? For supporting actress, you know, on the Gold Derby thing mm -hmm. uh, that I do, I have Regina King for Beale Street as my top actress. Interesting. Uh, for, for supporting actress. I mean, I, I, lo I, mean, I love Amy Adams. So, you know, I think that she'll get her sixth nomination. Um, and Claire Foy, I mean... I've been going back and forth. I mean, I think she's worthy of a, of a supporting actress mm -hmm. nomination, but as much as you know that I love First Man, it's just not hitting enough. Is, is Meryl uh, going to get in? Meryl? For like one scene in oh, Mary Poppins uh, or something? No. Like, that, people are talking about that. They, uh, as, they, as they have to when it's Meryl. Yeah, for, well, that's, that's a good point. I didn't even think I about don't that. know. But uh, so, okay, Regina King, in your mind, is the front runner. And yes. then Richard E. Grant, I don't know that he is necessarily the front runner, but this has to be a real boon for his you know, awards hopes, What a right? resurgence. Well, I mean, what, what resurgence, I, I... He never actually, really, like, was He was never away. really, like, uh, uh, at the at the tippy top of, mm -hmm. of... But, I mean, this is definitely a role that has uh, not only... 
I would say, rejuvenated him, but it is a, uh, it is a, a revelatory performance, one that is a game changer for him after like, geez, three decades of making movies. And he's always been just the, a, more of a supporting actor and he's always great in his movies. I mean, he made three movies with Robert Altman and, and he's always just so, so great in his films. And here he has this role in Can You Ever Forgive Me where he's just magnificent and that, that he, he, he is, uh, uh, for him to get this recognition, again, it's New York film critics, it's one of many critics groups, but right. it is New York, and, and I think that he is also a lock for a supporting actor nomination. Um, you know, he might, he might win, who knows? Yeah. But he's great in this film, and I mean, like, like bravo to him, and, and just, I'm so happy I agree, for him. he is fantastic, he brings a lot of life to that character, mm. uh, and, and yeah, this is, this is a big uh, award for him. Um, best nonfiction film went to Minding the Gap, which I still need to see. Perry saw it, I think, and was a big fan. Yeah, she did. She picked that it, as one of her movies when we bit. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Is, is Hulu? Uh, is it on Hulu right yeah, now? Yeah, it it's is. Available? Uh -huh, it okay. is. Uh, uh, Cold War won best foreign language film, and, and that you know we you may have to chalk that up to Roma just getting best picture. Sure, sure. Uh, and that could happen at the Oscars too, by the way. Right. Because like like right now, uh, up up to this very point of this conversation, I thought that Roma would be a lock for to win the Oscar for foreign film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe something else would go to uh, to actual best picture. Mm -hmm. But if Roma it actually turns out to be the front runner for best picture, Cold War could win foreign film at the Oscars. That would certainly be uh, an interesting situation. Yes, because Cold, Cold War would still be beating Roma. Like like the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's not just like being named by you know a critics group. It had actually have to beat it in competition. Um, Roma won best cinematography. It seems like that is also the front runner this year. Oh for sure, Rome. sure, yeah. Um, and then uh, the last thing we'll talk about with New York critics is Spider Man winning Best Animated Film. The critics have gone gaga for this. It's great. Our own John Roke and Christian Harloff are thinking of putting it in their top 10 for the year, which strikes me as, you know, maybe a, Did you see a it? little... Yeah, I saw it. I liked it. I was entertained by it. I enjoyed it. It was very clever. Uh, do I think that it was like... You know that much better than than Incredibles two? No, I think uh, it's, it's going to be a very close race. A very I close race. I disagree. I think Spider Man into the Spider Verse. I first of all, lifelong Spider Man film. I've mm -hmm. been reading Spider Man comics since I was four years old. The very first Spider Man comic I ever bought was Amazing Spider Man number ninety from nineteen seventy one. Stan Lee, John Romita, Gil Kane, and it is the death of Captain Stacy at the hands of Doc Ock. And I've been a Spider Man fan my whole life. And I love Spider-Man 2, the Tobey Maguire version, the best up until now. I think Into the Spider-Verse is not only the best Spider-Man movie ever, it is also wow. one of the greatest superhero movies ever. The Those animation, are big words coming from Scott Mance. The animation is glorious. I've never seen an animated movie like this. The movie, it's brilliant the way it brings all the spider people into together. It's, uh, it's very stylish. Listen, I thought it was very well done. I just, like, I'm surprised... You know, some critics, like, to me, are getting a little carried away with it. But, I don't but think it's a top a ten movie of the year. But it's it's existential. It is It balances heart, humor, action. And uh, it is uh, exhilarating and fun and exciting. And, I mean, I love Incredibles, too. But it's... This is different. This is a different film. This is animation that we've never, we've never seen animation like this. I really hope that, I, I think Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, it's the best animated movie of the year because of the way it definitely balances all these different it's, tones and it, styles and the visual look of it. It certainly seems like it's the, the animation frontrunner now, uh, or at least poses a serious threat to, to Pixar. How great would that be if best animated feature went to a Spider-Man film? I love that. <laughs> let's move on to National Board of yes, Review. Yes, let's. Okay, first of all, they named their best picture. Uh, not the same movie as the New York Film Critics. Ooh. Best feature for National Board of Review. To be fair, National Board of Review, not exactly uh, an accurate predictor of the Academy Awards, but they get so much attention. Why? And, and who are they? The, 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 in variety, they're New York-based film enthusiast collective. W what does that mean? Here's what, here, let's, say, let's say the National Board of Review picked their winners a month from now. No one would give a shit. They give a shit now because they're really one of the first it's people early out the, of the game. Early it's the season, so yeah. early. It is an awards uh, show or you know predictors, and that's why it gets as much attention as it does. Their best movie went to my best movie, which is Green Book. Uh, their director went to Bradley Cooper for A Star Is Born. Uh, okay, a uh, uh, good mix. I'm fine with mixing that up. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I have to say. 
that in terms of their top 10 movies, most of their films on their list, I would say seven out of the 10 are absolutely worthy and may even, I haven't done my list yet, may even make my top 10 list. But before I get to that, what did you think of actor and actress from the National Board of Review? Um, I agree with it. I mean, I thought Lady Gaga really was tremendous in A Star is Born. Some people claim that she's kind of just playing herself or a variation of herself, but she just really moved me. Like, I, I happened to see The Wife yesterday. I love The Wife. I watched The Wife, and Glenn Close is like fire at the end of that movie. You know, there's like a 20 minute stretch where, you know, Glenn Close is just acting her ass off. But if I had to put their performance up against Lady Gaga's, I got to give the nod to Gaga. Like, she just moved me throughout that entire film. Uh, and, and, you know, being it in her first big, you know, lead in a studio movie like that, I was really impressed by her. So, congrats to her on, on the NBR award. Listen, I, I think Lady Gaga is, is sensational in A Star is Born. Um, you know, you could argue that, oh, well, she's still playing a pop star, or at least she leads into that. I mean, listen, she gave a tour de force performance and she crushed it, but Glenn Close does not have an Oscar. She doesn't have an yeah, Oscar. Yeah, yeah, it could be a Pacino situation. Right, a Pacino. But, the, the, Paul the, but like Scent of a Woman, everybody loved, you know, like that was like a well, big. Well, look, look at Paul hit. Newman for The Color of Money. I mean, I love The, the Color of Money's Money. a, a big hit, too. Like, it was like, not a big hit. 1986, it was not a big hit. No, but, it was but very, the reviews were very It was mixed. seen. Roger it's Paul Ebert, Newman and Tom Cruise. Roger Ebert hated okay, uh, The Color but of Money. But, dude, the, the wife, no one has even seen. But so it's tough to win an, a, a, a career, so to speak, award for that if, the, if nobody's actually seen the movie. Well, I, I, listen, I, you know, Glenn Close is one of the top actors ever, and, and she's never won an Oscar. I mean, she really uh, came close when she did Albert Knobs. Uh, but again, you know, she's doing these roles in these movies that are art house cinema type movies. The Wife, especially one of them, never really expanded beyond the select cities or art house kind of a deal. But I think the, the um, people who vote for these types of groups, Academy voters, Guild voters, you know, they're getting their screener copy of the film. And I think that, yeah, I thought the movie was, it's about a, uh, um, you know, a long-term marriage that is hitting the skids uh, between Glenn Close and Jonathan Price. And I do think that the movie gets better as it goes along and the last 20 minutes of the film. So were makes the movie. Were you surprised that Glenn Close didn't win the NBA, like it wasn't recognized by NBR here? I, uh, I mean, not surprised. Again, if it was another group, if it was like the Golden Globes or the SAG Awards, I would have been surprised. I would have okay. seen that as a snub. But you know, again, NBR National Board of Review. Okay. I don't give that a whole lot of merit. But but Viggo Mortensen, Best Actor for for Green Book. You know, it's it's right now. It's between him and Bradley Cooper. Wouldn't you say? I mean, some people would say Christian Bale and Rami Malek, too. I mean, oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, but no, I, I think to me, in my mind, it is between Vigo and Bradley, and they, they went with Green Book and gave Bradley director, you know? Like, they spread the love. Yeah, they did spread the love. But as far as their top ten films, okay, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is the Coen Brothers. A is curious on choice. You curious know? choice. I don't know if it's top ten, but I liked it a lot. I liked it. I liked four and a half of the six stories, basically. Yeah, yeah. I didn't love all the stories. I liked maybe three or four out of the six. Yeah. And then you got Black Panther, which is definitely worthy of being on a top ten list. Great film. Definitely going to be on my top ten list. Uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me, Richard E. Grant, Melissa McCarthy. Uh, I think I see that as more of an actor's movie. And not so much like, you know, uh, there are other films that they have. People that are still talking about that, though. Like, because those performances are so good, it keeps that movie in the conversation. I could see that potentially sneaking into Best Picture. I, I, I want to see Melissa McCarthy get more attention for that film. And I feel like more, more people are talking about Richard E. Grant, which is great because mm -hmm. uh, he deserves it. But Melissa McCarthy deserves it, too. So, there's just so many great female performances right. this year. Yeah, there's know? always so many oh. slots. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me? Uh, uh, eighth Grade. Again, yep. one of the and best movies of the reformed. year. Another nod for first reformed. Um, Those are like the two big indie hits of the year, I feel like. Eighth yeah, grade eighth and first grade, reformed. first reformed. Those are like the, the critical consensus is landing. Uh, um, if okay. Beale Street could talk. Yep. Uh, then you got Mary Poppins Returns. Ooh, surprise. Uh, which I now have seen three times. My God. <laughs> and I loved it. I just really love Mary Poppins Returns. I just think that for a movie to follow 54 years after one of the all-time Disney classics, and for it to stand on its own. And Emily Blunt owns it. She owns it. She embodies her own version of Mary Poppins. I love the music, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda. I think this is going to be a big, fat, massive hit for Disney. And I think it's a Mary Poppins for our time, a new generation, to discover what? 
I can't, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, then a movie that I loved, I've been loving this movie and, and singing its praises since March, A Quiet Place, uh, a film that I hope sneaks into best picture category for the Academy Awards. Then of course, Roma, and then of course, A Star is Born. I would say that's a pretty solid list. I don't yeah. agree with all of them, but there's nothing There's nothing in that list that I'm going like, what? Buster Scruggs is the only kind of like eyebrow raiser where you're like, huh, that's, uh, you know, the inclusion is curious, but I don't know. If you're a big Coen Brothers fan, I guess it makes sense. Okay, well, let's uh, move who, who on then. Who's voting for these things? Let's move on now to the Gotham Awards. Well, a- before we move on, yeah. though, I, I wanted to run. Uh, so, so Incredibles 2 did take the animated fu- uh, okay. feature here. So that is, I think, going to be a battle. Uh, but yeah, battle uh, of the superheroes. Season. Exactly, which is, which is interesting. Paul Schrader, again, won uh, a screenplay award. Barry Jen- Jenkins won the other one. Thomas and McKenzie for Leave No Trace. Uh, that was a, a big breakthrough performance for her. Uh, Bo Burnham won directorial debut. So again, that first feature, you're, you're, you're seeing Bo mm-hmm. Burnham's name come up a lot. Again, Definitely. Cold War with foreign language film. Now, this is, that's interesting, don't you think? Like, why didn't Roma win foreign language films since it, it's not like it took Best Picture? Wow. Okay. What yeah. did win Best uh, Foreign Film there? Cold War. Cold War, wow, okay. Yeah, so that's a legitimate upset, unlike, you know, with the New York critics, since they gave Roma their best picture. A legitimate upset for the National Board of Review. Right, <laughs> <Okay>. exactly. <laughs> uh, RBG, best documentary, and, and then best ensemble, Crazy Rich Asians. I wonder if we'll see that actually score a SAG nomination. So RBG won best documentary over uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor and Three Identical Strangers. Yeah. Interesting, RBG's very, very becoming- interesting. The, the front runner. Those I are the three movies. Those are really the three docs. That and, and Free Solo. Those are the four. Um, other foreign language movies that were honored Burning, uh, The Guilty, Shoplifters. I mean, have you seen any of these movies? Any? No. Um, top five docs included, like you said, Three Identical Strangers, Won't You Be My Neighbor, Free Solo, and Minding the Gap. And then did you see the indie films list? Uh, I did not. What's on it? Oh, it was like, uh, you know, Death of Stalin, Lean on Pete, Leave No Trace, Mid-90s, Old Man and the Gun, The Rider, Searching, Sorry to Bother You, We the Animals, and You Were Never Really Here. Of all those movies, do any of them actually stand a chance at best at a Best Picture nomination? Like Of, a, a of any horse? of those films that, that are, uh, uh, well, I mean, I think the indie movie of the year that could really crack the Oscars for Best Feature, the eighth grade is the one. It really okay. is. Having said that, The Rider is a film that I, I absolutely love. The Rider is going to be on my film. top ten list. So. The Rider is great. Yeah. The Rider is great. Uh, Brady Jandro was fantastic in the movie. And uh, Chloe Zhao, yeah. uh, you know, she wrote she and directed it. In fact, uh, The Rider was the best picture of the year from our next award show. All right, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the Gotham Awards. The Gotham Awards named the writer best picture of the year. I saw the movie actually at the San Francisco Film Festival back in April, and I thought it was just a a, a, a really beautiful, uh, meditative, existential, modern Western that just was very confident direction. Uh, and writing and a, a, a terrific movie, Chloe uh, Zhao, uh, female director, just a lot of great movies this year directed so, so by women. It, it's like nominated, it's up for best feature, right? Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So so do you think that it stands a chance? No, no, again? it won, it won. Did it? Because, yeah. Oh, the, the, that's, the, uh, you, know, you, you might be looking at an older, uh, an older thing there, oh, but okay. it was actually, Forget it was actually, uh, it won Right. Uh, it won the, uh, uh, okay, okay. yeah, so, yeah, so, so the rider is the best picture from the Gotham Awards. Best documentary went to Won't You Be My Neighbor? No surprise there. Uh, then more love for First Reform. Ethan Hawke, best actor from the Gotham right. Award for First Reform. And best actress, let's give it up. Let's show some love for Tony Collette <laughs> for Hereditary. I want to see her get more love. I know that she's going to get more love, but but you know, I want I would love to see her really get in to Best Actress at the Academy that, Awards. That's a big upset. I mean, o- over Glenn Close. Uh, yeah, Tony Collette. I, I don't know how real those uh, those Oscar chances are, but A24 I feel like is doing a decent job of keeping her in the conversation. Well, here's the thing about Hereditary: if you look, take away the you know the career aspect for Glenn Close, take away how much. Uh, Lady Gaga really crushes it in A Star is Born, playing a pop star, she is a pop star. Like, hands down, measure for measure, on their own terms, just looking at the performances, the range of physical and emotional turmoil that Toni Collette goes through in Hereditary, 
bar none, makes that the best performance of the year by an actress. Toni Collette is superb, and but I just feel like, you know, for whatever reason, just like you know, every award show was kind of different. More people really do need to sort of like get behind and push Hereditary, and especially Toni Collette for best. Do you actor. think so? That that's a horror movie. You know, I I do think that the Academy has a horror movie bias. Uh, at least at times, it's, it, it picks and chooses in sp its spots. But do you think if Hereditary had come out in October, we'd be talking about her chances more seriously? More so, yeah, absolutely. Like, did the release date hurt that? Listen, I'm just uh, curious. Her if Hereditary came out in October, like that would have been a hell of a Halloween movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, I know Halloween was the, was the Halloween movie, right. and that made over $150 million. But, like, Hereditary was such a, I mean, it was a Sundance movie. It opened over the summer. And had that movie come out in October, like I just wonder if we'd t be taking her chances more seriously then if it was a fall film. Yeah, um, yeah. Eighth grade picking up, you know, you know, break breakthrough actor and breakthrough director. No surprise there. Uh, Paul Schrader, another screenplay award. So he won all three of the awards here, right? Yeah, she. Yep. Um, and so he he's really pulling away in that race. And then in best documentary, the last uh, thing to talk about here is Hale County. This morning, this evening, have mm -hmm. you seen that? No, I did not. Yeah, that that beat out Shirkers, Mining the Gap. Won't you be my neighbor? So that was a bit of a surprise. Wow. Yeah. This, see, this is the fun of it that everybody's sort of weighing in on different things, and that's what's making award season and definitely this show so much fun to do because. You know, there's no Titanic, there's no Return of the King, there's no Argo, no one thing that's that's just like the one. It makes the conversation more lively. It certainly makes makes us relevant from week to week. <laughs> yeah. Because we have a lot more to talk about. Well, one of the things I love are the scores. There have been a lot of great scores this year. And Alexander Despot did a terrific score for Isle of Dogs. I, I love the score for If Beale Street Could Talk. And two-time Academy Award winner Justin Hurwitz who worked with Damien Chazelle, director Damien Chazelle, for the fourth time on First Man. He did a great job with that score, and it was so great to have Justin Hurwitz come into the Collider studio to talk about his score for First Man, working with Damien again. So let's take a look at that. Well, this is very exciting. We are joined here now by Justin Hurwitz. He is the composer for First Man, the composer for La La Land and Whiplash, and basically, all of Damien Chazelle's movies. This is the fourth film that you've scored for him and it's the fourth movie that he's directed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, where where does it start now, really, with him? Do you sort of have a rhythm with him going, like, with each film that passes? Yeah, I mean, our process, it, things change each time, uh, but so much of our process is exactly the way it was when we were 20, working on that first movie. Um, just the way we start with piano demos and then start building out from there. Um, so there's this real familiarity, and it's almost like going back to, it's like, oh, back to that phase. It, 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 it almost feels like, you know, uh, uh, it's like, you know, the school year starting again. It's like, here we, here we go, um, back to this sort of familiar place. Well, this is more than just the school year. This is like <laughs> Ivy Lee College here, because, you know, the score, it's so symphonic. It's so orchestral. Uh, like, where did those first talks with Damien really start with, like, you know, uh, sort of the, the approach you were going to do, your point of connection with the first man score? Uh, it always starts with the themes. What are the themes going to be? And that's uh, what I mean when it's piano demos. We just, I, I work a lot at the piano and just send many, many, many ideas to him. And we're talking about, you know, what it needs to feel like. I've read a couple drafts of the script so far. And in this case, I'd read a, an early draft of Josh Singer's and then a kind of closer to their, er, their pre-production draft. So I'd read two drafts and then we were talking about what the themes needed to feel like. And Damien was giving me a lot of words, a lot of things like, um, you know, it needs a lot of pain in it, needs a lot of grief, a lot of loneliness. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So he was giving me some direction like that, and I was just sending ideas one after another, and he was saying, no, 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 no. That one's interesting, but maybe not quite right. Keep going, and I was just, until going, this is what we do until I send one until I find one that he just really, he says, that's the movie. Because the whole movie's in his head. Um, I haven't seen the movie yet. Um, I've, at, at the best, just read a script or two. But he's seen it all. He knows what it feels like. He knows the tone of it. And so I'm just trying to sort of find the movie that he's been seeing in his head all this time. Sure. So once I strike that tone, once I strike that feeling, then, um, you know, when he lights up, then I know, then we both know that, okay, we're 
maybe we were on the right track, we found a theme, but we have to st keep developing it. What are the, what's the instrumentation gonna be after the, after we know what the melody is gonna be, what's the instrumentation, what's the, the tone of it, what are the sounds of it? And this score had more of that um, in terms of like searching than other scores we've done because like other scores we knew, okay, it was gonna be big band or La La Land, it was gonna be an orchestra, but this, like after we cracked the melody, then there was a whole phase of, well, what, what's it gonna sound like because we didn't know at that time, so. Cracking the melody. Yeah. What point did you get that point where you got from Damien? Yeah, that's it, that's the theme of the film. Like what was, do you remember that day, that moment when you played whatever it was, uh, whether it was on the piano yeah. or, or, or something else, where he yeah. just went, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, I, okay, so uh, I remember the first, uh, when I, it always starts as a seed of something. So I sent like a couple phrases of a melody. So, oh, I really like that. Where could it go from there? So I try to hear, oh, I like that. But at that point, at, you know, 18 seconds or whatever, I don't like how high it goes. So maybe try something, oh, I try mm -hmm. something else. So we keep going. Um, I think it, what, I think it was like theme 62 or something. And then, um, and when we go like A, 62A, 62B, 62C, D, E, we just kept going. And I remember like it was, um, I wish I remembered like how many letters it was into it, but it was a lot. And um, uh, I remember I was, when I finally, like the moment, the moment that I think you're talking about was um, I was in my car. I had sent him something and then I went and I was running an errand and I saw I had an email and, and I looked in my car. I was definitely at a stop sign. I wasn't yeah. driving. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, he said, that's it. That's the one. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that phrase because it was such a relief. Um, and it was it was it was a couple months of just like searching for the searching for it. And um, that's it that's the one it was like okay it's over now we can move on um it's always like it's very exciting when i sit down at the piano at the beginning of the process but the piano part of the process it also becomes the most frustrating part for me because it's just it's so unclear how long it's going to take and if it'll ever happen and it's, wow. it's like the it's the phase where i get sometimes the most self-doubt and the most like i don't know if we're going to find this so like when i when i saw those words that's it that's the one I was like, okay, great. Yeah. So, but there's, there's, so the mu the music is, uh, uh, it's very thematic or so very orchestral, but there's also like a retro feel to it. And I think uh, a lot of that has to do with the theremin. Mm -hmm. So what point did you bring that into the fold? Because especially with the scenes on the moon, you know, there are, there are parts of that score, parts of that theme that feel very much like 2001, a space odyssey. Mm -hmm. So like what, bringing that into the fold there, how'd that happen? So as, as soon as we were done with the piano part of it, just like looking for the melodies, there were a couple of themes. There was like a main theme and a second sort of theme. And as soon as we found those, we just started talking about, okay, what what's it gonna sound like? What are the instruments gonna be? What are the sounds gonna be? Mm -hmm. And Damien suggested theremin. Um, it's, it's of course like associated with space and sci-fi and we sure. had some, you know, references in mind, mostly kind of like 50, 60 sci-fi movies, but he brought it up and he said, um, what if that we could use the theremin, but make it really emotional, make it really, um, really like, you know, we associate it with like weirdness and it's strange and it's alien, but what if we, we used it really kind of expressively almost like, um, you know, the way maybe a violin would be used or something, how, what if we could use it really melodically um, and emotionally? So I, I, I got one and I started messing around with it and trying our, our melody on it. We had the melody at that point, so I just started trying it. And it, I just loved how, um, how expressive it could be, how, um, how the melody sat on it and how it could just, it took, it, it could, takes on a quality that's sometimes almost voice-like. Um, yeah, there can like be it a, sounds like uh, someone crying. Yep, crying, ways, yeah. singing, wailing, um, depending on how much vibrato you give to it and all that. And um, we just loved, as soon as we heard our melody on it, um, we just kind of loved how it felt. And then I just started using it, trying it. We were making a lot of demos at that time. This is still during pre-production. So it was kind of almost like you know, blue sky ahead, just like there wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of time pressure at the, at the time to get stuff done. So we were just playing around and I was trying it not just on the melody, but as sort of counter melody and sort of bearing it in cues, having cues that had other orchestral instruments, but you know, layering just a little bit of theremin just, just to add some color. And um, we loved how that worked too. So we just started trying to use it in as many places as possible. And 
Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Moog synthesizer is something else that you get brought into it. And, yeah. and overall, like, like when I first saw the film, and I've seen it three times, the, it, it just struck me just how visceral the film is, mm -hmm. how it is unlike any other movie that's ever been done about mm -hmm. the space race. And mm -hmm. trust me, I've seen them all. <laughs> I've seen all the movies uh, from the Earth to the Moon, the HBO series, mm -hmm. all the documentaries, you know, like Moonshot and, and, you know, Mission Control. I mean, like all of it. And just how this is not just a movie that you watch. It is a movie that you feel. Mm. You feel how dangerous it is yeah. more than any other movie about the space race. And like like looking at the Gemini uh, capsule, yeah. all the nuts and the bolts, yeah. like you're, you're going into space in that thing, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but like when you started to see, because I know you started working, yeah. writing the score, writing the music, uh, uh, and before he started shooting. Yeah. So when you started to see, let's say you started seeing dailies, mm -hmm. like how did that sort of steer your direction with the score, if it even did. It did. Okay. Um, yeah. I was watching all the dailies. They were in Atlanta. I was back in LA. So I was every day I was getting the dailies. Mm -hmm. And um, it actually, when I saw the first photography of Linus, Linus Sandgren, who shot the movie, it really, I, I finally got um, the tone, the um, kind of the aesthetic of it in a way. Because Damien had talked a little bit. I remember early, early on his kind of general pitch for the movie. It was going to be a lot of handheld and it was going to shoot on film. But that's still very abstract to me. Um, again, he has the movie in his head. I don't. Yeah. So um, <laughs> once I started to see some of those some of those dailies or some of the shots um, and I saw exactly how much life there was in the frame, mm -hmm. how much you know shake sometimes there was to the camera, especially in the intimate scenes, um, too, you know, with the family, with Karen, the daughter, like that started to sort of give me some ideas for how the music can have this sort of like um, um, f unsteadiness or f fragile fragility to it. Um, so that started to inform some ideas in terms of the, the the strings have all been put through these processes that give them this shake that I thought sort of worked with the the life that was in the the the, the frame and and then also I would say the the colors as well, and I don't really know how to describe that because that's more of an abstract thing, but once I saw how some of those colors looked on that film, it just, it, it, it just, it's hard to describe, but it kind of, it, in, it informs what the music needs to be. I, I don't care how many times I see this footage, whether it's, it's actual documentary footage or in a film, especially in First Man, the launch of the Saturn V, mm -hmm. I swear, it, it never gets old, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, just the, 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 the booming part of the score when you just see it sitting there yeah. and then the launch of it and then uh, the, the score while Neil and Buzz are landing the Eagle. Yeah. Uh, like, how did you like? That was a very big part yeah. of the score. Like, like what was behind the uh, yeah. the the uh, motif of of that part yeah. of the score? Well, that landing cue that that was one of the big mockups that we made before Damien shot the movie. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted a lot of music created before he shot it, and that was one of the ones we focused on. Um, so it was a it was a mockup, and we had our we had sort of had the material, you know, like I said, at the piano, so we knew the, the melody, you know, um, and we knew the secondary piece. So basically those were the two pieces he wanted. He wanted the main um, melody and then he wanted that that riff, that sort of triplets riff, bop, 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 Those were the two pieces of material. And we talked about um, how we'd use them, you know, we'd use the melody in, in, um, for some of uh, Neil's sort of uh, inner emotional life, his relationship with his with his kids, um, the pain he was going through, the loss sure. he was going through, and then we were going to use the motif, that triplet thing, as sort of like the family material throughout the movie. And then we talked about, well, what if we finally put them together for that landing cue? It's like the, it's like it all comes together in this moment because like it's it's all I mean, his mind is he's going through this like incredible adventure and doing this, you know, historic thing, but his, it's all been fueled by everything he's experienced, his, the experience with his family, his mind is very much at home as well. It's all kind of part of the same story for him. So we talked about, well, that would be a moment to finally put these two pieces of material together. So Damien and I just started working on a mock-up for that. So um, we made that piece of music. He likes to have um, music on set for some of it. So he had that mock-up 
Oh, he had that mock up and, and other pieces of music on set that I know he was referencing. And then um, he and Tom Cross, the editor, used that to get started in the editing room. I had to sort of reshape and refit a lot of it to the picture as they were cutting it, but it got them started. So that's kind of, it's almost because, you know, we had been making musicals where you do create, you have to create a lot of music before you, you shoot and cut the movie. Sure. So we kind of approached it the same way in, in the sense of that cue. And then with the, like, the launch cue, um, that I would say was that well, or it's the launch cue and the cue right before it that you reference, where you see the Saturn on the on the launch pad, the big brass. Yeah, board. oh, it's great. That's that 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 um, cue we call contingency statements. Um, the one before, right before the launch, where Neil is leaving home and um, intercut with the head of NASA reading that statement in the case that these men don't come back from oh, this mission. God. Yeah, it's really kind of very poignant, very chilling, and that's the cue where we finally start to introduce the brass. Um, and then we used the brass a lot in the launch. We'd been withholding a lot of the weight of the orchestra, keeping it really intimate up until that point because um, you know, so much of the movie is it's it's with it's with Neil and Janet and the kids, and um, we wanted to keep it really delicate and really intimate. And but as that mission starts, we start introducing the brass and the full woodwinds, and um, it grows and grows. And then certainly the launch cue, and then the landing, and then some of the stuff in the moon. We use the full orchestra finally. What is it like? You know, because I saw some of the uh, documentary footage that the B-roll of you conducting. A 94-piece mm -hmm. orchestra. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like? What is that like to 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 conduct a 94-piece orchestra? It's awesome. It was re it was really fun. Um, <laughs> I'm still pretty new at conducting, so um, each time I do it, I loosen up a little bit. I I figure out. I make fewer mistakes than I made the last time, and learn a little more of what I can do to help them. Um, I would say this was the first time I've conducted where I actually felt. Um, a connection between what I was doing and, and what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, the first few times I conducted, I was just really focused on like just like keeping time, which they don't even really need because you know they all have click tracks and they can yeah, count. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I I was trying to find ways this time to maybe inform a little bit of how I was feeling about the music or what I was feeling in it, and hoping that that could convey to them like sort of maybe how they felt about it or how to play it. And, and I did finally, for the first time, start to feel a little bit of a, like, what I was doing was they were responding to it. And that was a, that's, it's hard to describe how that feels. It's an incredible feeling to feel all this huge body of players and these incredible musicians, like, responding to you, responding to the way you lean into certain, you know, notes. And um, it's, it's an incredible feeling. So, so, okay. I, I just just jump in the gun here. What's next for you and Damien? Like, have you already have you thought about like the next thing? <laughs> uh, I have I have no idea. I think he's he's writing. I think he he's uh, he's probably I think he's writing his next movie. So I think he's last I heard he was like kind of researching and starting that process. But I'm I mean whatever he he wants to do next, I'm up for it. I'm up for it too. <laughs> and and Justin, thank you so much for joining us you on, for, for your me. consideration. And now back to our panel. That was a really good interview, Scott. Yeah, yeah. He's he's so he's so uh, he's so passionate about his scores, and you know this score was very very different from the other scores that he's done. I mean, this one is much more orchestral, and uh, I I mean I think that he'll definitely get nominated uh, for for another score for first band. He did Justin a great Hurts. job with it. Well, it is always interesting talking movies yes. with you, Jeff Snyder, and make sure you please share the love for your consideration and spread it on Twitter, on Instagram, on, on YouTube, on, and you know, make sure you like the comment, make sure you comment below, let us know what you think of the uh, different award shows that we talked about today. Make sure you share for your consideration with movie fans, make sure you share the podcast version, make sure you hit me up at Movie Mance, let me know what you thought of for your consideration. Hit this guy at. I'm at the end, Snyder, and we're gonna have Perry Nemiroff back uh, on, on the next episode. I don't know which category we're gonna be talking about, but we'll make it a good one. Yeah, we'll make it a good category, and we're also going to weigh in on the Golden Globe nominations and how that may or may not affect the Academy Awards. Make sure you ch check us out next time on Collider FYC. Until then, FY, see you later. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.